go ahead and get started. We have one of our awesome retina fellows here today. S you know, initially, I, I all I saw on the title was LASIK, and I was wondering, why is she talking about LASIK? But then, when you read the whole title, she's, uh, she's going to be talking to us today about posterior segment complications of LASIK. Sounds like a very interesting topic. I'll go ahead and turn the time over to Julia. I thought you were going to say there are no posterior segment complications of LASIK. And we can all go home. All right, so um, as everybody knows, LASIK is the most common procedure for the treatment of refractive errors in the world. And it's obviously very safe and efficacious. And there may be some people in the audience who have had LASIK surgery for correction of refractive error. And the most commonly reported LASIK complications that we hear about and talk about are related to the refractive outcome, overcorrections, undercorrections, as well as corneal and anterior segment injury and wound healing. But there actually are some posterior segment complications of LASIK, but they're very, very rare. And they're rarely reported because they're usually managed by a different set of doctors than the people who perform the LASIK surgery, surgery in the first place. But the main reason that it's difficult to talk about posterior segment complications of LASIK is because it's hard to establish a cause and effect relationship um, in individual cases. In other words, if you hear about a myopic patient undergoing LASIK who developed a retinal detachment a month later, it's hard to say that, that the retinal detachment was caused by the LASIK procedure. All we can say is that there is a suggestive temporal relationship. And there's no standardized approach in the literature or in our discussion of this to say, what is the time window that we attribute things to LASIK or even consider a suggestive time frame? For example, if somebody develops a macular hole eight months after having LASIK surgery, does that have anything to do with the LASIK or they're just developing a macular hole? And even if there's a suggestive temporal relationship, something happening a few days after, there's still no conclusive proof that the LASIK surgery was the cause. So why is the retina fellow thinking about this at all? Um, well, I got to thinking about it because I saw this patient. Uh, this was a 30-year-old woman who had mild myopia, and she underwent un an uneventful LASIK procedure. And I saw her in the retina clinic about two weeks later, and she was complaining about intolerable distortion and um, shadows in her left eye. And these are the color funnest photographs of the back of both her eyes. Um, unfortunately, this photograph doesn't really do justice um, to what the exam was, but I'll, I'll kind of tell you uh, what I saw. The right eye, she was 20-20 in both eyes. The right eye had a completely, completely normal fundus, good foveal reflex, no changes in the pigmentation whatsoever. And the left eye, and it's kind of, it's hard to see because the, the uh, macula itself looked completely normal and there was a good foveal reflex, but um, kind of overlying the macula and over the fovea, there were several little circular globs right in the vitreous um, of what looked like uh, blood that was resolving. And you can see them on OCT. You can see them kind of casting a shadow over the retina. And you catch them here in the hyaloid, and they're casting a shadow on her retina. The problem is because she was a 30-year-old woman, she had a very formed hyaloid. So these things were sitting right over her fovea and not really budging kind of really interfering with her vision. And that's kind of what they look like. There are these little circles. Um, and we can see some suggestion that maybe the hyaloid had separated here, just kind of focally over the area of the fovea. So I guess the first question is, why would LASIK affect the posterior segment at all? Why should there be any effect? Um, and I guess the intuitive thought is, there's some sort of mechanical stress on the eye when we're doing LASIK surgery. Um, in order to create a corneal flap by a microkeratome, a suction ring has to be applied to the globe. And so an intuitive thought is that the axial length of the eye is going to change when that happens, and that can cause traction on the macula in the vitreous base and create breaks in the retina. So this is something that's actually been looked at and studied. Um, whether or not the axial le length, in fact, changes um, in LASIK surgery. And <coughs> there are two recent cadaver eye studies and one in vivo study um, 
all using a scan ultrasound to measure axial length. And the two cadaver studies actually had conflicting results. There was a study of six pig eyes that showed that the globe shortened during application of the suction ring for the microkeratome. And um, in eight human enucleated eyes, they showed that the globe lengthened. The in vivo study um, looked at axial length before and after application of the suction ring in 21 eyes, and they found no significant changes in axial length. What they did notice that is that the lens thickness decreased in 18 patients, so about 86% of the eyes. And their hypothesis was that shrinkage of the lens diameter may cause a power vector, especially in young myopes, where the anterior hyaloid is adherent to the posterior lens, and that can create some sort of tractional force um, causing tears or macular holes. And in less formed vitreous cavities, um, contraction of the lens may cause a PVD, a posterior vitreous detachment. Other things that have been looked at to try to explain um, why LASIK may cause posterior segment complication is complications is cutting time. Um, it's believed, and I got the sense from reviewing the literature that longer suction times may be associated with a higher risk of posterior segment complications, but there's not really definitive data to show that. Um, but interestingly, posterior segment complications like optic neuropathy um, were reported in the early um, days of LASIK when suction times were longer than they are now, and there really have not been any recent case reports of that happening. The other interesting phenomenon is that the number of published posterior segment complications has not increased proportionally to the increase of um, the number of total LASIK procedures, which makes you wonder, are we using better microkeratomes or shorter um, suction times? Um, another more new development, femtosecond laser to create the flap, is that better? Um, it Obviously, femtosecond laser allows a non-mechanical creation of the corneal flap, but you still need a suction ring to stabilize the eye. There is less vacuum with the femtosecond laser technique. It's about 30 to 40 millimeters mercury as compared to 60 with a conventional microkeratome, but longer times are required to create the flap. And um, interestingly, there is a case report from 2005 from UCLA of uh, macular hemorrhage after femtosecond assisted LASIK. <coughs> What about the laser treatment itself? Um, all posterior segment complications of LASIK have been reported either with primary procedures or with enhancements that involved recutting of the flap, so always using the microkeratome. There are no reports of vitreoretinal complications just with lifting a flap. Um, however, interestingly, there are two reports, one of retinal tears and one of a detachment after PRK, where obviously no suction ring was applied at all. So, um, and again, you know, this is not a cause and effect. This is kind of a temporal thing. Somebody had PRK and then they had a detachment. Can't say the PRK caused the detachment, but it's a temporal relationship that's being reported in the literature. So what are these posterior segment complications that I'm talking about? Um, posterior vitreous detachment, phragmatogenous retinal detachment, coronary vascularization and macular hemorrhages, um, macular holes and cystoid macular edema, and then more rarely optic nerve disease, visual field defects, uh, vascular events like choroidal infarctions, and really just rare um, case reports of uvula effusions, central serous choroidopathy, um, choroidal infarctions, like I said, and toxoplasmosis reactivation. So there's a couple of interesting studies about developing PVDs um, after LASIK surgery. There's a study from Argentina um, that looked at B-scan ultrasound before and after LASIK in 50, um, in 100 um, eyes of 50 patients who underwent myopic LASIK. And um, the ex if the patients already had a PVD, they were excluded from the study. So these were all people who did not have a PVD preoperatively. And um, interestingly, 4% or two eyes in the low myopic group, so less than minus four refractive error, and 24% or 12 eyes in the high myopic group, uh, which is greater than minus seven, um, developed PVDs by ultrasound uh, post LASIK. Subjectively, 8% of the patients in the low myopic group and 32% in the high myopic group reported symptomatic floaters after LASIK. 
And um, in another study, similar percentages, 95 uh, myopic eyes up to minus 838 refractive error, nine developed a partial PDD after LASIK. So um, sort of same percentages. Regmatogenous RD. So um, again, keeping in mind it's kind of hard to attribute the detachment to the surgery, um, but it's still interesting to kind of look back and, and see the incidence rates of this. And um, Dr. Arevalo does a lot of work on this in uh, Venezuela. And he did a retrospective review of over 38,000 consecutive eyes that underwent myopic LASIK. And the refractive error range was minus 75 to minus 29, which I think is kind of surprising. I guess in Venezuela they do LASIK for uh, minus 29. Uh, the mean was minus six, and 0.08%, um, so 33 eyes of 27 patients developed retinal detachment. But the range was 12 days to 60 months post-op with a mean of 16 months. Um, the mean preoperative refractive error in eyes that did develop a detachment was about minus 875. The outcomes um, of surgery to repair regmatogenous detachment in these patients was that a best corrected visual acuity of 24 year better was obtained in 38% of the eyes and 2200 or worse in 22% and that's mainly because of proliferative vitreal retinopathy or delayed referral to a vitreo retinal specialist. So again, a temporal, not causal relationship between LASIK and regmatogenous retinal detachment and interestingly, the overall yearly incidence of retinal detachment um, in myopic eyes uh, up to minus 475 is published in the literature as 0.015%. And in high myopes, um, greater than minus 10 is 0.075 per year. So this is actually a lower incidence rate than just the overall rate of retinal detachment in a high myope over minus 10. Um, another interesting study that I came across, appropriately entitled Im Importance of Fundoscopy in Refractive Surgery, published in the Journal of Refractive Surgery in 2007, looked at 4,800 consecutive LASIK patients in a practice, I think in Denmark, over three years undergoing LASIK. And they reported, the good thing about this study is that they actually had sort of a more standardized examination of the patients pre and post LASIK. Um, and they reported 52 patients who had posterior segment pathology that required intervention. 45 of these were detected preoperatively. So there were only seven cases post-op and they had reliable fundoscopic examinations of these patients pre-op. So they knew that they had normal retinas before. Um, and the pathology was absor uh, observed between 10 and 60 months follow-up and only two of the patients came in with symptoms of flashes and floaters. Um, none of these seven cases actually had a detachment. They all had um, either tears or you know, holes in lattice that were treated. So um, the incidence of retinal detachment they reported was 0.03 per year in the myopic candidates and there were no cases of detachment after the refractive procedure. So, and again, that's a lower incidence rate than even in the low, low myopes. Um, another interesting, this is kind of an aside, um, there's a paper about refractive surgery after sclerobuckling for retinal detachment. Um, and I always wondered about that. Um, does it work? Is it, is it good? Is it safe? I mean, it's a small study. It's only 10 patients. But um, these are people who had one or more previous retina reattachment surgeries, and they all had a sclerobuckle. Um, that was one of the <coughs> inclusion criteria for the study. And I think five of them had LASIK and four had PRK and they were followed for an average of 67 um, plus minus 14 months. So everybody was attached at that follow-up period. Nobody had a redetachment or a new tear or new retinal pathology. The problem was that only six patients landed within a diopter of their intended correction, um, seven within two, and then one patient was plus 225 over, one was minus 250 and one was minus three. So the refractive outcome was very disappointing, I think. Um, so it may be safe redetachment-wise, but um, the refractive outcome, at least in this study, was disappointing. And then from the standpoint of retinal surgery on patients who have had LASIK, um, 
we always worry about the flap, flap dislocation. Um, and it is a risk of vitreo retinal surgery on LASIK patients, especially if the epithelium has to be debrided, the cornea is becoming edematous. Um, you can lose the flap completely or just by manipulating the epithelium, um, displace it so that you get interface particles, strain the flap, epithelial ingrowth. Um, if the flap is displaced or disturbed during surgery, um, the recommendation is to, um, you know, obviously irrigate the interface if it's been lifted, replace it, replace the planar contact lens over it and send the patient to their anterior segment um, doctor immediately. Um, there's actually some authors in that advocate using a contact lens over the cornea and using a sutured lens in 20 gauge to 25 gauge cases, but that's not um, routinely done. Um, the recommendations overall for a patient, LASIK patients who are going to have retinal surgery is to avoid epithelial debridement if at all possible. Um, knowing the location of the hinge before surgery is very helpful, even, you know, just knowing it just in case. Uh, because then you can direct your epithelial scrape. Um, if the location of the hinge is unknown, the recommendation is to start nasally and advance temporally because that's usually where it is and your risks of displacing it are the least. And using a non-contact wide angle viewing system like the biome instead of um, um, irrigating contact lenses. Um, so Going back to the posterior segment complications, choroidal neovascularization and macular hemorrhage, um, it's kind of disappointing literature on this. Obviously, high myopia can be associated with breaks in Brooks membrane and choroidal neovascular membranes unrelated to having a LASIK procedure. Um, and macular hemorrhages and lacquer cracks have been reported after LASIK. There was a study of um, 2,955 consecutive LASIK treatments and in that study, three eyes developed new choroidal neovascularization, 0.1%. Uh, but the interval, again, was four to 26 months, and that incidence rate was not different than in their practice just for myopic patients developing CMVM. So it seems like having LASIK didn't really affect that incidence rate. Um, there is a case report of a unilateral valsalva-like retinopathy with subhyloid, intraretinal, and subretinal hemorrhage 15 hours after bilateral hyperopic lacement. Macular hole, um, again, Aravalo did a big retrospective study to look at the incidence of macular holes, and he found it to be 0.02 in a population of 83, over 83,000 myopic eyes. Um, the holes occurred within the first six postoperative months in 60% of the patients, and 18 of the 19 patients were female. Um, the outcome of macular hole repair in this patient was very similar to idiopathic macular holes. Um, there was hole closure and improvement in visual acuity in 92.8% of the cases. Um, interestingly, in a Chinese cohort of almost 2,000 consecutive surgeries that were followed for a year, there were no macular holes observed at all. Um, optic nerve diseases and visual field defects, like I mentioned, um, these are just case reports, and um, there's a case report of a 28-year-old female who had a unilateral visual field defect that persisted a year after bilateral LASIK, and a 39-year-old man with bilateral optic neuropathy who had visual field defects um, um, in, in both eyes after LASIK. But there have not been any reports since 2001, which um, is being attributed to better instrumentation and shorter suction times. Um, Additional adverse effects, uveal effusion syndrome has been described in three eyes of two patients for hyperopic LASIK, not surprisingly. Um, there has been a case report of bilateral choroidal infarctions in a 23-year-old woman who had hyperopic LASIK, and there have been two reports of reactivation of ocular toxoplasmosis after LASIK, one five days and one 50 days post -op, 52 days post-op, and that may be related to topical steroid use after um, the surgery. Um, central serous, there have been three case reports to date in the literature regarding central serous following LASIK. Um, one patient was myopic and um, had symptoms a month after LASIK. One patient had unilateral hyperopic LASIK and had symptoms five weeks after. And one patient had bilateral high hyperopic LASIK, really high, plus five and plus seven, and had symptoms four days um, after the procedure but on uh, 
further review of his history, it sounded like he may have actually had a history of central serous before having the refractive procedure. And there have been no cases reported of central serous um, in the literature in PRK patients. The reason that I'm harping on CSCR is that we actually did a study about CSCR, looking a retrospective um, study of CSCR patients over the past five years. And uh, we found some interesting observations regarding refractive surgery that I want to share with you. So we looked at all patients at the Moran Eye Center um, who have been treated for central CRS. And we identified about 250 patients, eight of which had a previous history of refractive surgery. Five had LASIK and two had PRK. And none of these patients had any documented um, oral or inhaled steroid use. Um, several of them reported high stress jobs. One was a TV producer, one was an engineer, and um, several of them reported being type A personalities for whatever that's worth. Um, so here's the sort of the table of results. And um, obviously this is a retrospective chart review, so it, it has the limitations of that. So for example, for patient five, um, he was seen for central CRS in retina, but we did not have good information about actually when he had his LASIK, what his refractive error was, and um, how long before we saw him. So, um, but what I'd like to point out that's interesting here is that the two PRK patients actually developed symptoms, one a month after and one 19 days after their surgery, and they were both mild. Um, everybody else, you know, I don't really think this is, it's hard to say that it's related to the LASIK, I mean, nine years out. Um, so again, it's difficult to establish a cause and effect relationship, and obviously central serous is a multifactorial disease, um, but it's possible that the longer use of topical steroids after PRK may be a risk factor, and this may be why the, the two PRK patients um, actually had symptoms at least within a suggested time window after their surgery. So what's the bottom line? What am I trying to say? Um, refractive surgery is very safe from the posterior segment perspective. And it's possible that increased suction times with the microkeratome are associated with a higher rate of posterior segment complications, but that is not proven. Um, the key is dilated fundus examinations prior to refractive surgery are important. Um, there should be a retina evaluation for any areas of suspicious lattice, atrophic peripheral holes, um, and a careful macula examination for, um, you know, pathology like myopic related changes, lacquer cracks, you know, pigmentation changes that may suggest old central serous. Um, and of course, there has to be a discussion with the patient regarding the need for follow-up based on the preoperative refractive status. In other words, the risks of being a myope don't disappear after um, surgical correction of refractive error. That's all I have. <laughs> Questions, comments? Yes, that's my turn. <coughs> Well, you know, there's really no guidelines specifically, especially.
Yes. <laughs> I mean, I think it helps, just like Dr. Bernstein was saying, um, for them to see a retina person and to have that discussion about, you know, the possible risks. I think when it comes from a vitreoretinal surgeon, it's, you know, maybe has more of an impact. I mean, obviously, you don't have to. Um, as long as you document that you've seen it and you've discussed with the patient that, you know, that may predispose them to a retinal detachment. The thing is, you can't, we really don't know if the LASIK procedure itself is an independent risk factor for the patient um, with that atrophic hole for developing a detachment. We don't have an answer for that. So that may be something that you need to discuss and document that you discuss. I mean, the other thing is in these studies that, you know, that I was mentioning about detachment, they kind of glom together all the detachment, the detachments that they saw afterwards. But for example, one of the cases was a young myope who was like minus 50 mil U who developed bilateral retinal detachments 12 days after LASIK. So again, can I tell you that that's what caused it? No, but that's a pretty suggestive thing when somebody walks in 12 days after, um, you know, high myope with bilateral detachments as opposed to somebody who 60 months later, you know, developed a unilateral focal detachment, maybe that myope would have had it anyway. Right. Right.
that in the study, because even though they looked at so many patients retrospectively, the number of detachments is so low that it's not really powered enough to look at ACEs that we've seen. 